Hey Greep, what's up? It's the Culture Detective here, investigating your favorite album. See? <laughs> Today, I'm going to do an album review on the latest Black Midi album, Cavalcade. Black Midi is a band from UK, and this is their sophomore album, Cavalcade. This has got to be one of the most hyped up, one of the most anticipated albums of 2021. After two years ago, they dropped Schlagenheim, and while Schlagenheim isn't perfect, it is certainly one of the most refreshing, promising, strange, quirky, math rock, noise rock, post-punk, abstract, avant-garde, flavored, no-wave rock album to be released in the last few years. I mean, we got the very jagged, rugged, insane, chaotic 953. Of course, we have the metamorphing, freaky Frankenstein that is of Schlagenheim. And of course, we have near Detroit, Michigan, where Cameron Picton screams like, like he's gone insane. There's lead in the water! There's lead in the water! And finally, Black Midi, aka Jordy Greep, Morgan Simpson and Cameron Picton are back this year with Cavalcade. And uh, holy shit, holy shit. Now call me RYM Core, call me a, call me a, a quirky, faux quirky person, but um, this, this album, this album is friggin' amazing. And of course, aside from Black Midi's latest album, lately in the year 2021, we also have all kinds of experimental art punk slash rock albums from Europe, especially in the UK. And now we have Black Midi, and damn, this, this wave, this new wave of art punk and experimental rock music is really refreshing and promising and I just really look forward to every single album in this wave. But the one that I look forward to the most is Black Frickin' Midi. And it is Cavalcade. I mean, just look at this goddamn album art. This album art has got to be my favorite album cover of the entire year so far. This is the kind of album cover where you look at it and you're like, I have no idea what the hell am I looking at? And that's good. I also really like the album cover to Schlagenheim, except one gripe I have with that album cover is that there's a chunk of empty space, which is a little distracting. It's a little off balance, but this one though, yes, yes. So anyways, the album starts off with John L or John 50, and immediately we have one of the strangest, most chaotic, most unhinged and and just insane musical pieces of the year so far with screaming jagged guitars which almost resembles screaming wailing kazoos and then we have sudden stops sudden silence we have bursts of strings we have an ambient sound in the back which sounds like the earth is slowly crumbling and shattering and we have lyrics which are basically, according to Genius, is basically about what happens when cult followers suddenly turn against a cult leader, and that cult leader is the king, John L, or John 50. And the way Jordy Greep delivers the vocals on this track, it's almost like he's narrating like an epic novel or something. Crowds of every age, creed and gender are abound. Senior Kitsch sings skits detailing each of Hendy sins. The first time anteaters lose themselves in the wings. With vigor they scratch red spots overwhelmed by their kings. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. It's fucking brilliant. And then the song just slowly accelerates and expands into this crazy, reverby, unkempt, off kiltered thing. This monster with wacky, out of control drumsticks and guitars, and it all just speeds up until the very end. And it's absolutely insane, and it's easily one of my favorite songs of the year already. Next up, we have Marlene. Dietrich, which is of course referring to the German-American actress who is very popular in the early 20th century. And this song is a slow, sweet, and endearing soft rock song, which 
completely contrasts the ugly, chaotic explosion that is John L. This thing has soft guitars, really soft drums, and the chord progressions are really dreamy and nice. And I also kind of like it, even though at the beginning, for sure, I was kind of confused at the placement of this song, given that the last track and this track doesn't flow together all that well. But with this contrast, I can see <laughs> how wacky this album is trying to be and, and the kind of approach that this, tr that this album is going for. And the lyrics on this track is incredibly patronizing, basically idolizing Marlon Dietrich in, in the most patronizing and, and idolizing way possible, so much so that it's very self-aware, especially in the last verse, damn us all idiots, damn us till death. Anyways, we have the third track, Chondro Malasia Patella, which, <laughs> which is um, another word for a, a syndrome that is basically um, knee pain syndrome. And this track is also one of the singles leading up to this album. And this track is a really weird, freaky, unpredictable avant-prog track with rough jagged guitars with wailing tones tight hand drums quirky guitar rhythms and the whole thing is equal parts avant-garde equal parts jazzy equal parts post-punk flavored and all of these genres just melt into one another very very brilliantly and seamlessly this track kind of slows down in the middle and then it sort of builds up the pace again and it becomes this really speedy, sharp, explosive ending with the most ear-pooling, skin-scratching guitars at the end. It's almost like the ending to 953, but on crack. And it is a really good song as well. And it leads into Slow, which is also another really strange rhythmic avant-prog jazz track except this time with an even tighter rhythm and cycling guitars and also these saxophones in the background which is also cycling along with the guitars and we got Cameron Picton singing on this track and his vocals flow with the instrumentals really smoothly when the instrumentals get loud his voice gets loud when the instrumentals quiet down his voice quiets down and it just shows a lot of dynamic and change and progression and in the middle we get these very smooth guitars and strings which are really really beautiful and it ends off very intensely once again and this track is essentially about waiting to die or at least wanting to die but realizing that this process is really slow instead of being a fast abrupt end it's really slow and it's a very ex existential track and i kind of like that pretty much every single track on this album is about something different and the way they're all put together it's almost like they are cut out from different materials like a chunk of this wood a piece of this cloth a slice of that glass, a bit of this bricks and ceramic, and sort of stitch them together in a really weird and jarring and, and unnatural way. And this is why I'm, I'm kind of fine with the very weird, choppy, jarring sequencing of this album, is because I'm kind of getting that vibe where it's like Black Midi is cutting this from this, cutting that from that, and putting it all together into this weird, freaky album thing. And in a sense, I kind of appreciate the style that they're going for. But anyways, back to Slow, it's friggin' amazing. Next up, we have Diamond Stuff, which is a six and a half minute long slow burn. And it is easily the quietest song and the most stripped back song off of the entire album. And the title of the track is a reference to a book, which is called We Are Made of Diamond Stuff. And this track features slow picking guitars and also murmuring from, I believe, Cameron Picton. And it's just very patience testing. And for the first four minutes, pretty much not much happens. And, and then afterwards, we have the song getting louder and louder, picking up the pace. 
and we get these very smooth and watery drum guitar instrumentals which reminds me a lot of in rainbows or even hail to the thief era radiohead uh, i know another radiohead reference uh culture detective why but uh, yeah, I like the ending to this song. But that being said though, this song still pales in comparison with the rest of the track list. And uh, I, wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say this song is great or anything. But, but, but Black Midi certainly delivers a hard ass ending for the album. A hard ass ending for the album. Diamond Stuff basically transitions into Dethroned with these really heavenly saxophones and an atmospheric background, almost like they're playing in in a in a hotel lounge or in an airport of sorts, and we're listening to these saxophones from 10, 10 miles apart or something. And then very smoothly we have these bass, these very reverby, icy bass that just slowly chimes into the track and it just climbs up and down and up and down and up and down in a very vigorous and violent manner and then we have Jordy Greep hopping onto the track with reverby vocals and it just becomes more and more fiery more and more violent and it easily becomes one of the most energetic tracks off of the entire album this thing slaps it explodes and we also have these these um chromatic scale climbs which transitions into these little bits of guitar bursts and these oscillating these vibrating guitars it really reminds me a lot of the guitar tones off of like battles gloss drop and i really love it it really adds a lot of texture to these guitars which is ever so interesting and lyrically this track is about a man's fall from grace dethroned and the way it is presented is just so epic and so and so refreshing it's amazing and black midi pulls no punches and immediately transitions into a song which is even harder than dethroned and that is hogwash and balderdash and god damn this song is absolutely insane it's almost like um a death metal song or a thrash metal song but but with avant-garde jazz prog influences. And essentially this song is about two chickens running away from the law. There's something so ridiculously stupid at the same time so like folk tale, at the same time so real and, 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 and anxiety inducing about this track, which makes this track so amazing. Especially the opening, the opening two sentences of every single verse on this track. Hogwash and balderdash, chickens from the pen. And yeah, the swelling strings at the end, the clashing cymbals, it's absolutely insane. And I really love the freak folk guitar bits where all the instrumentals suddenly shut down. They're all silent and we just hear this twinkling bit of freak folk guitars like like it's from a Richard Dawkins album or something. And it's hilarious and it's fantastic. And then the album ends off with the one and only 10 minute long epic orchestral ballad Ascending Forth. And Ascending Forth is both this, this, um, this interval, this musical interval, like ascending forth, but also like back and forth. So ascending forth, like we're going to someplace else because this track really sounds both heavenly and hellish at the same time where we get these really beautiful guitars and lyrics on this track essentially about the music industry. And there are a lot of songs made by a lot of artists which criticizes how rigid and stiff and uncreative the music industry has become, but none of these songs did it as well as Ascending Forth. Ascending Forth is truly epic, grandiose, dare I say. In a few moments in this track, we get these very gorgeous, just absolutely beautiful, grandiose instrumental swells with saxophones and strings with really bold theatrical chord progressions. And also the ending to the track, which is, oh my god, the ending to this track is tragic. Because essentially, the protagonist of this song, he loves writing songs, he loves writing music. And everybody loves ascending fourths. 
so he tries writing songs without ascending forth in his own style and nobody liked him and he sort of fell off the map he became irrelevant people started disliking his music and he's like you know what <sighs> i got no choice so he started writing ascending fourths and he keeps on writing them and writing them and people start to love his music again more and more more and more more and more and at the end it's just like everybody including the the artist himself the music critics everyone just screaming how much they love ascending fourths and it's just like it's just like everybody's brainwashed by this ascending fourths epidemic and it's tragic as hell and it also goes to show that there are people nowadays there are musical artists nowadays who write some of the blandest cheapest and and the most washed down watered down pop songs and, and mainstream songs and trap rap songs and all that and maybe we can't really blame them for being uncreative or or being bad at music maybe maybe they're actually passionate about creating something different and refreshing but they can't because the people won't allow them to and so this track is just amazing in revealing that and sure the transition between hogwash and balderdash and ascending forth is really abrupt and really jarring but again one of the things that this album is going for is the very cut and paste styled kind of style and i kind of don't mind that really jarring transition not really and the way ascending forth ended is uh beautiful it's powerful and i'm left with no words so yeah black midi with cavalcade absolutely amazing album really strange really weird and sure there are still a lot of influences left and right but they blend all these influences so well and bring their own style with Jordy Greep's very eccentric performance, Morgan Simpson's tight and, and fast-paced drumming, and Cameron Picton's guitars and backup vocals. The tracks on this album also showcase a lot of versatility, which is amazing. And uh, once again, the cut and paste style of this album, very intriguing. And certainly this is one of the most memorable listens of the year so far. So uh, Black Midi, Cavalcade. Favorite track here is, I can't really pick one, it's either John L, Slow, Ascending Forth, or Dethroned, or Hogwash and Balderdash. It could be any of those. And my least favorite is um, Diamond Stuff. I'm giving Black Midi's Cavalcade a 9 out of 10. So, have you listened to the latest Black Midi album? For more time, would you read it, like, like, and subscribe if you want more, and thanks for watching. Originally, I planned to review the latest Natalia La Forcade album, but I'm going to do that tomorrow. And then, a day later, I'm going to review Bruno Pernada's Private Reasons.